distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome Ray Dalio. And he has a new title, so I have to make sure I get it right. He is founder, <laughs> CIO mentor, and board member of Bridgewater. Is that right? Yeah. Great, I got it. Uh, newly minted. Uh, so it's great to have you here. It's really wonderful to get to talk to you. Uh, I have to say we have a little pressure on us because the governor's already said what he wants, which is not to depress everybody. So <laughs> <laughs> work on that, okay? I, I, you all know Ray is the premier macro investor of, of, of our time. Uh, and goodness knows we've got a lot of macro right now. I mean, from central banks around the world uh, tightening their monetary policy to China on the rise to a ground war in Europe for the first time since World War II. So the question, I think, for all of us today is where are we, where are we going? But Ray, what you have taught me and I think others is in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you've been. Uh, and Ray has written a terrific book I really recommend, The Principles of Dealing with the Changing World Order, where he goes back through 500 years, but also at one point you go back farther than that. You go back with China to like 500, as I recall, uh, to sort of say, you know what, we may not have been exactly here before, but we've been someplace that looks like this. So in order to address some of the issues today, Brad, give us an overall structure of what you found in going through history and the cycles that you identified that you think still apply today. Okay, I, I, I will do that. But I just want to also say that uh, I had the opportunity of uh, seeing Governor Lamont in action, and I just want to tell you that I love Connecticut, and it has had a difficult time, and I've seen at, at a very nitty-gritty level how um, the various problems that you've dealt with in a uh, moderate way. And if there's one thing that I really think our country needs, it's a m strong middle that is basically able to bring things together in the interests of uh, the, the country. And I could go through the fact that kids didn't have computers and dentists, and he runs around and he does things. So I just want to, again, uh, thank you, Ned, for be doing what you do anyway. Um, to answer your question, uh, okay, uh, in, my, in my years of doing this, so something like over a little over 50 years, what I found is that many times in my life, things that surprised me were because of, they never happened in my lifetime before, but they happened many times in history. So, for example, then studying these earlier times, if they happen mechanistically, I need to know how they work. So I studied the Great Depression. That's why we anticipated the 2008 financial crisis, because the same things happen over and over again, but sometimes not in our lifetimes. And so there were three big things. There are three big things that are happening uh, to us that haven't happened in our lifetime. I like to measure things so I can see them in numbers and charts and so on. And those three big things are, first, the amount of debt and money creation, how much debt we have, the rate at which we are creating it, and then where we're getting that money from, the Federal Reserve and other central banks printing it. So that has never happened to this degree except for the 1930 to 45 period, which I studied before. And I needed to go back and hit study that in history. The second of those two things is the amount of internal conflict, populism of the left and the right, irreconcilable differences, with the largest wealth gaps that have existed, so the greatest political gaps, the greatest amount of populism, largest wealth gaps um, since you have to go back to the 1930 to 45 period, and actually it's larger than that and you have to go back to 1900 to see that. By the way, if you want to see it, you'll see the charts in that. So um, we have a financial issue. We have an internal conflict issue that has very big implications for how well our country is run, but also what does it mean for taxes? What does it mean for the value of assets? I need to understand that. And the third was um, international conflict. Um, so in my whole lifetime, the United States was clearly a dominant power, and we were in the American world order. 1945, the United States was the, became the leading world power, counted for half world GDP. We had 80% of the world's money, because gold was money then, and we had a military monopoly. And so the reason that um, we were the world's power, that's why the United Nations is in New York, and IMF and World Banker in Washington, so a dominant pro. But uh, we could see this conflict, this emerging competition. 
And I didn't, the last time that happened was the 1930 to 45 period, and I need to study that. And so I studied that pattern, and these are the big things in our lives right now, but we don't, are not acquainted with it. And I, so I needed to study the rise and declines of currencies, the rise and declines of empires. And because these cycles go on um, over a long period of time, I needed to see enough of those cases, so I had to go, uh, go back, let's say, the 500 years. So I studied all of those. Now, I'm not an, ac an academic, I'm a practitioner. So it's not like I'm writing history books. It's for the purpose of making decisions today. So th what I learned there has been important in us posi our positioning in the markets right now. So it's just that practical. But those are the three big things. I also studied, saw in history that there were two other things that were very important. Um, one was um, acts of nature actually toppled more civilizations, killed more people than the others that I just mentioned. Uh, and though they are um, uh, droughts, floods, and pandemics. But, but like a pandemic, that's another one that comes along once in a lifetime that we don't see it. And then, of course, the most important force over a long period of time is man's adaptability and inventiveness. And now we have a greater ability. So, and that's the plus. You know, the others are challenging. So that's it in a nutshell. So Ray, you talked about the fact that during our lifetime, the United States has been dominant in the world. Uh, it's not as dominant today as it was 20, 30 years ago, uh, economically or militarily and compared to other people. Where are we right now in the cycle with respect to the United States? Uh, are we at the peak? Are we coming down? How fast are we coming down? Um, we're, uh, again, uh, when I say these things, I use measures. Um, there are 18 measures of health, and you can see them in the book. And they're measures of things like, what is your percentage of world GDP? What is your percentage of exports? How are your reserve currency? But also, what is your education level, level of education? What is your competitiveness? 18 measures of that. And um, we are in decline. We're declining on a relative basis, but even also some measures in an absolute basis. Um, so that's what the arc is. And then uh, China has been the leading competitor. Um, I've been having, uh, f for, uh, not since 1984, I've been going to China. Watch it, since I started going there, per capita income has increased by 26 times. And so if you use measures of comparability in military, technology, share of world GDP, all of that, uh, you see that. That's, that is the only real power. Um, there are military powers, but history has shown if you're um, a military power and you're not an economic power, while you may be a threat, um, you're not going to win the war. So that's what that l the picture looks like. So if you go back to And we could, we could see it, right? Um, we can see it in our various ways. If, if you go back 500 years as you did, you have the Dutch, you have the British, you have the U.S. Uh, can a, a civilization, an empire, as you describe it, change at least the slope of the curve? And I'll give you a specific example right now. Your first thing was creating a lot of debt, creating a lot of money, generating money. The Federal Reserve right now is trying to reserve, reverse that process. Could that slow down the decline? Well, I'm going to take the second, what the Federal Reserve is doing um, in a second, and I'll deal with the, uh, the first. It's all a matter of basics. Can't, do you earn more than you spend? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have a good income savings? And do you have a good balance sheet? Um, do you have one or two parents who care for you and um, give you the, the guidance and the values. Can I go to a good public school and, and have food and health care and come out with uh, an environment of equal opportunity? That's all you need. That's all you need. Because if you do those things, you will have a civil population that will be productive and that you will be financially capable, mm -hmm. strong, and um, so you're going to do things better and better and you'll be strong. So it comes down to those fundamentals. When I look at one country or another and I'm thinking, where do I want to invest? It's like I'm looking at those things 
Um, do they have a problem with internal conflict or is it orderly? Just those basics. Now, the question is, can we do those basics? Okay? So, how are we doing on those basics? You have measures to judge that. Yes, we can do it. And I think the most important thing is how we are with each other. Like, um, uh, do we have a democracy in which we can come together and have a, like a very strong bipo bi bipartisan middle, okay, and then work on dealing with those things? Like, uh, uh, you know, Governor Lamont um, gave, touched on some of those basics. So it, that becomes the big question, I think. Uh, but, but how are we doing, and again, come back to the Fed for a second. Because oh, the Fed. It sounds okay. to me like the Fed is trying the to Fed take a step in the, uh, what you would call the right direction right yeah, now. Yeah, but what happens is, like it's, 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 it's really simple, you know. Um, the way the system works is, if you give a lot of money and credit, and you make it cheap enough, they will spend it. Okay, but when you create debt, um, it's stimulative over the short run and depressing over the long run. Because when you have to pay it back, then you have to um, earn more than you spend to pay it back. So what do you do with that debt? Okay, it, if, if you make it tough to pay it back, then what happens is you have a, a, an economic downturn. If you make it easy, you print the money. And those are the, that's the cycle. So when we look at what the Fed has done, the Fed and the government together gave an enormous amount of debt and credit and created a lurch forward, it, a giant lurch forward, and created a bubble, okay, and now they're putting on the brakes. Okay, so now we're going to create a giant lurch backward, I think, because it's simple. The amount of, we talk about inflation. Inflation is a very simple thing. It's the amount of money that's spent, money and credit spent, divided by the quantity sold is the price. And so if you take that money away, then, you're, then you, you can't get rid of inflation. The way you get rid of inflation is to get people to spend less. And that is what an economic downturn. So the cycle goes like that, and then when you get to the point where, let's say, the economic pain is greater than the inflation pain, then you see them do the opposite. So we're going through that particular cycle. So it's, I think, a delusion to believe that, okay, what they're going to do is look, uh, deal with inflation, and it'll all go away because they'll deal with inflation by doing that without realizing what that means in terms of that, uh, the, the, what that means of buying power. Think about the, um, the supply demand of bonds, just to give you, mm -hmm. we have to sell debt. Um, well, the government is going to borrow, central government is going to borrow about 5% of GDP, so they have to sell bonds in that amount. The, F the Federal Reserve is going to sell, or have run off the balance sheet, about 5% of GDP. That's 10% of GDP. Okay, who's going to buy the bonds? Who's going to buy that? Oh, now they don't want to buy the bonds. We've had, uh, you know, pension funds, others, you know, they, they don't want to buy that bonds. Foreigners don't want to buy the bonds. So then what, the way that works is interest rates have got to go up to a level that constricts mm -hmm. private credit demand. And when that happens, then there's less spending. That's the mechanics. So there's that trade-off. And I think we're going to be in an environment in which they're trying to navigate these two difficult, you don't want too much inflation, and you don't want too weak an economy. And so they're trying to navigate that, which will be probably something like the 70s. And that's all happening in the context of the political conflict, which is very important, right. and the international conflict, because the international conflict has bearing on things like inflation, uh, supply lines, and all of that. You just said something, something briefly, something like the 70s. Uh, and my question is, what are we in store for here? I mean, we had, in some ways, like seven years of feast, and now we have seven years of famine. Is that what we're looking at right now? in order to get inflation back in line? Because thus far, the Fed is being pretty convincing to a lot of people. They really mean what they say. Yes, and the consequences, just everybody, is do, do you understand what that means? That's great. They mean what they say. What they've done is they've produced this giant lurch forward, 
And now, yes, they will raise interest rates to the point that there's enough economic pain and financial market pain to deal with that. And it'll be real pain, no question about it, not least in, in the form of unemployment, in all likelihood, that we're going to have to have. At the same point, from your point of view, your perspective on history, despite the pain, is it the right thing to do? Because in the long run, even the people who make less are hurt by inflation more than anybody else is. Um, the key, of course, is to try to get the balance as, as best as we can. I, 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 you know, I call it a beautiful deleveraging. You need a beautiful deleveraging. Um, you, how do, in history, uh, debts decline relative to incomes? So you could go back and see the mechanics of that. And the way that happens is a mix of um, some amount of restructuring debts, mm -hmm. and that is a um, deflationary force because um, one man's debts are another man's assets. And so, what you, so some amount of restructuring is a deflationary force. You take buying power away from others. And then some form of debt monetization and to get the stimulation, and you try, they tried to get the middle ground. Because of the size of the issues we're, we're dealing with, it's not something that we're used to in terms of its magnitude, I think. So, and then if we take the internal conflict factor, I, I, mean, I think we have to look at all three because they play a role. And so it, it's traditionally, those three things are the perfect storm, right? They all affect mm -hmm. each other. So if, we, if you have a bad economic situation, as you said, it affects one group of people and it hurts them, then you have an internal political conflict, right? The left and the right, the rich and the poor, and so on. And then that affects things, and vice versa. And then, of course, the external conflict, the cost of the external conflict. Like, for example, um, it's estimated that so far um, um, it, the cost of two to the Ukraine war, of the Ukraine war to NATO, is something like eight, eight trillion dollars. If you look at, um, to rebuild, are we gonna rebuild? Are they gonna rebuild? They ask the NATO countries like they ask the European countries. Uh, are you gonna put in? Well, they're broke, and they're gonna put in. Then if you d look at the cost of climate change. Climate change um, is approximately 10 trillion dollars a year. Um, if you look at um, the cost of building infrastructure, if you look at the cost of all of those costs and you add up those costs, those are, it's not like we're going to stop the spending. So you have to achieve that financial balance in some kind of a way. Right now, um, governments, governments are like people, meaning uh, when you spend, you think this, the basic economics works the same. The only difference is they get to print money. So when you th spend, you think, how much money do I have to spend? And then, wherefore, what do I prioritize it on? Uh, Governor Lamont has that challenge. We all have that challenge, not the federal government. So what happens is the government says, what do we need to spend money on? And they then go spend the money, and we don't have that balance. So that issue is a big fundamental issue, particularly when we have populism on both sides. I want to turn to China, which you mentioned, but before that, let me ask one question. Given where the United States is in the cycle, one of the things you talk about in your book is reserve currencies. And when you become dominant, you get to have the reserve currency, like the British pound before, US dollar now. Given where we are, why is the US dollar so strong? Is it too strong? Well, so I think it's important for you and everybody to understand that it, you're not, you shouldn't look at the value of the dollar in relationship to other currencies as much. I mean, they're all bad currencies. So we can get into why Europe is a bad currency and why the yen is a bad currency. They're all bad currencies. And they are all depreciating in buying power, just like the 30s, just like the 70s. They all depreciate in relationship to what they can buy. Uh, currency is money. Um, but when we look at them, one in relationship to another, we may not pay attention to that. So that's our existing set of circumstances. You know, okay, the answer is um, the euro. Are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, um, we can go on about Europe situation. Wow, oh my God. And then, and then okay, what, what are they doing in the end? They're, they're just 
printing the money, whatever it is. And so the question is, what is a storehold of wealth? You know, money is uh, a medium of exchange or a storehold of wealth. And it's not a good storehold of wealth when the interest rate you're receiving is much less than the inflation rate. So that's what you're seeing happen. Well, let, before we get to China, let me pick up on exactly that point. Given what you're saying about the world in terms of inflation and the, the reduction in the value of the currencies around the world, where is the right storehold of wealth? I mean, is it gold? Is it Bitcoin? What, where do you go the, to, to defend yourself against inflation? This is, um, this is the question of our time. We will, over the next 10 years, certainly, I think, be trying to find the answer of what is the storehold of wealth. Because usually it, it, it's a money and then a debt instrument in holding that money. But as that goes down, then there is the question of what it is. What is that currency and storehold of wealth? So we're in that place. It's always handy to be the thing that you, is your buying power. You're going to see it more in inflation hedge assets. So like if you're thinking about a bond, it's better to think about an inflation hedge bond than to think about uh, you know, a, a tips mm -hmm. or inflation hedge assets along those lines. And I think that you're going to see then uh, the parts of the economy. So like I think basically, um, if I was saving, what would I want to save in? I'd like to save in the things I know that I'm going to need. So I would like to save in like my residence, my house. I would like to save, if I could, pay forward my kids' education, pay forward the food or the health care that I can, and so on. I would want, want to mm -hmm. save in those things to buy forward the things I need, most fundamentally. Mm -hmm. I think if we start to think that way, not only in terms of the investment, but what are, what are even the meat and potatoes type of businesses that are doing that? And then also, I think that um, you have to think geographically. Where is best in the world? Okay, that, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, uh, best in the world are countries in which they're earning more than they're spending and their balance sheets are, have more assets and liabilities on them, that they're s civil with each other and not, they're not in conflict, and that they're not in risk of an international war. It's basically those fundamentals. And then I would say we are in an intellectual revolution that our capacity to invent and think and use technologies to help us think has never been greater than before. And so those revolutionary type of technologies when they're cutting edge, I think that those are good investments. And I think then what you have to do is also diversify. That because the, the thing I learned is um, um, it's all return in relation to risk. Everybody looks at how much return you make, but it only takes one time to knock you out. You know, I've, we've been doing, Bridgewater has been doing this 47 years and we survived. You have to survive first. It only takes one time to knock you out of the game. And so you should never lose more than X amount of money that you can't recover. Because you lose 50%, it takes 100% to get back. So um, diversification, knowing how to do that well, allows you to reduce your risk by up to 80% without um, reducing your return. So I think that those would be the approaches that I would emphasize in this environment. So and I would not, generally speaking, I don't think we're going to have a sustainable interest rate that is going to be a real adequate interest rate. And so I would stay away from uh, debt is issue. Um, uh, debt. Uh, now, the interest rates went from ridiculously stupid in interest rates, and they're coming into an, era, uh, an area that still, I think, is too low but it's not as ridiculous as it was before. They have to get really, yeah. so when you play with that game, if you want me to just do it, I'll just do, give you my thought real quick. Okay, what would be the equilibrium interest rate for the equilibrium inflation rate, okay? We're gonna have probably, I, I, I would estimate, we estimate maybe between, somewhere between a structural employment uh, inflation rate, maybe in the vicinity of uh, between four and five percent. In a highly un, uh, certain environment, you can't even be sure of that, but let's say that. That means, then, what is the real bond yield? Okay, so you have to go to that. Um, we now have about a 1.5% real bond yield. Um, do you still have a 1%? So you have to have the bond yield give you something. I don't know what that is, but that brings it above 4.5% to some other number. 
and you have to have relatively tight money, which means that you have a fairly flat yield curve. So I don't know whether that's 4.5% or uh, the, the economy could not take an interest rate much higher than that before it's going to be negative. So those are the things that enter into my thinking in terms of what markets and what the portfolio would look like. Applying that analysis, is China a good investment? And more specifically, is President Xi a good investment? Because it looks like we're going to have at least five more years of President Xi. Okay. I, um, um, let me, uh, I want to be clear in making um, that from my getting to know mm -hmm. the leaders, and I don't know Xi, but I know the, those around them, um, that they are reasonable people. And, one, and there's going to be a change in leadership uh, that we're going to see on Sunday. And you're going to, in my opinion, you're going to bring um, reasonable people into that. There's a culture, there's that. And then there is, but there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of problems. So let me rattle off the uncertainties and the problems that are temporary, um, that could be temporary, but they, they could be longer lasting. The first is um, they have a debt crisis that, um, in my opinion, they've allowed to go too far into the bones of the economy. Mm -hmm. So it's affecting local governments, it's affecting uh, financial institutions. Um, it starts with real estate. Um, real estate um, is 25% of their economy approximately, and then the majority of savings. So it has a wealth effect, it has a negative, and it's passing through the system. So that's one. Um, second um, is that uh, there's this question of are they still in favor of free enterprise and the market system and what does common prosperity mean and so on. Quite a lot of confusion regarding that. From my uh, operating there, they, uh, they don't want to mess with that system very much. Um, she doesn't. Um, because when they did some things like shutting down um, some of the tech companies because they want to break up the minority, the, uh, these uh, large companies, they also did minority uh, things. Anyway, um, so let me go th number three, COVID. Okay, number four is demographics. Okay, demographics is particularly important in China because of the culture in China as well as the one-child policy. You know, for... Um, the family takes care of the family. And so the tradition is that the children take care of the adults at, in old age. They don't have a well-developed pension system. And so what happens is with the one-child policy, a husband and wife has four parents that they have to take care of. System can't deal with that. And so that's a main thing. It relates to COVID. You know, they have something like 350 million people over 65. So if they don't deal with, so we have COVID. So you have a number of these problems. You have a, a, a climate problem and a water problem in China. So China's got a lot of those problems to deal with. But the real question, and we, we, we all can have problems. The real question is, uh, where is that beacon? Is that beacon, and we're going to learn more about that based on who's appointed to what jobs and also what statements are made. Is that beacon continuing to do the things that raise productivity and inventiveness and so on? So we're going to learn more. But I think that as far as investing in China, um, China is the, um, if you t take certain industries, it's, a, it's you know main competitor. But it's, uh, neither should know, uh, in my opinion, uh, not you have, to have a you have to have a certain amount in China. I think the longer term picture in China is still bright because I know the people mm -hmm. and I know the culture and I think it's good, but they have um, major issues now. Last subject, Ray, Bridgewater. As I say, you have a new title. Uh, I'm curious about what's different and what's the same for you and for Bridgewater. What do you expect will be the same? What will be different? Well, different is, okay. 47 years ago, uh, you know, my two-bedroom apartment with a friend, we started Bridgewater 47 years ago. And then we built up this community, meaningful work and meaningful relationships through radical truthfulness and radical transparency over that period of time. And like a parent of a 47-year-old, what do you want more than anything? I want more than anything them to be successful without me, right? That's the arc in life. So I'm 73, that's what I want. And so um, 
uh, and it took a while. I'm like, I didn't know. It's very difficult. I would run the company. I would do the investment part. I would do the management part and so on. And, and, and it became too much. And then the trial and error. And I have very, very high standards. And so, but, and now we have a fabulous team. We have a fabulous board and everything. And I'm there. So that's joyous. As far as what that means, it means pretty much that, um, uh, th like your kids, they have control of their lives, mm -hmm. right? And they're solid, and, they're, and it's great, and so I'm very happy about that. And then I could do pretty much whatever I want with them or without them. They want, th I want to be a mentor, right? I love the investment game, so I'll keep playing it. I'll keep doing it, coming up with my ideas and so on. And then I'll also help them be more successful by the operating as the mentor. And I could do that like uh, without the um, burden of the, uh, you know, all the issues that one operates when, you know, the, you, the responsibilities are with you. So it's, it, you know, it's a great joy. You can't imagine how joyous it is. Just finally, just to continue your analogy, mm -hmm. with your children, you hope that you sort of imbued them with certain character. Right. They'll make their own decisions, which will be different from your decisions, but basically it'll be consistent. Are you confident that your DNA is in Bridgewater? They'll keep to the DNA, even if they'll make different decisions than you would have made. Right. That's a culture. Culture is destiny. And they have that culture. And it, it's, it's almost like the United States, the Constitution, what is America, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we grow up with that. And that'll influence, but it'll evolve the way it should evolve. The way, and, you know, and they'll probably make it b better than I did and, and so on. So, yeah, they've got the culture. Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater. Thank you so much. Ray. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. It was terrific.